Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will continue with our 14th session of this special webinar series uh, on mainstreaming for industrial revolution uh, technologies and, mo and, and mo business models organized by the UNIDO Directorate of Digitalization, Technology and Agribusiness. We will continue embarking us on, in a more in-depth examination journey of these technologies, their operation, mechanisms, business models, and their relevance in the context of the specific sec of sectors. For that, as usual, I will start sharing my screen to introduce the session. So my name is Alejandro Rivera Rojas. I am the UNIDO DTA Director Executive Officer, and I will be moderating this uh, session titled How Artificial Intelligence and Big Data Are Driving the Digital Transformation in the Pharmaceutical Industry. For this occasion, we will have with us Mr. Christoph Herwig, Professor of Biochemical Engineering at the Technical University in Vienna. Christoph holds a degree in bioprocess engineering from the ART WTH agent and a PhD in bioprocess identification from the Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne in Switzerland. Since 2008, Christoph is a professor of biochemical engineering at the Vienna Technical University. Research area focuses on development of data, science methods for integrated and efficient bioprocess development. In 2013, he founded the company Expotech, addressing data and science solutions for the biopharma life cycles. We will have with us also Mr. Tony Manzano, co-founder and um, chief uh, scientist officer of ISON. Tony is the co-founder and CSO of ISON, a cloud computing uh, company that provides big data and artificial intelligence software as a service platform for the biotech and pharma industry. He's a member of the scientific committee of the Parental Drug Association Europe and teaches in the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He has written numerous articles in the pharma field and holds a dozen international patents related to the encryption, transmission, storage, and processing of large volume of data for regulated environments in the cloud. We will have with us also Ms. Teresa Minero, which is the director of the ISPE International Board of Directors, founder and CEO of Life B Digitalizing Life Sciences. With a background in computer science, Teresa Minero is, is the founder and CEO of Life B, a consulting company and digital company dedicated to life science since 2004. She has more than 30 years of experience in managing innovation projects for production, logistics, quality, labs, regulatory, and research and development. She is currently part of the board of directors of the International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering, where she serves as a reference for pharma 4.0. She has been a lecturer and chairman at the many conferences and author of several articles in digitalizing life science and pharma 4.0. And last but not least, we will have with us our colleague, Mr. Hassan. He is a pharmaceutical industry expert advisor uh, from the Quality Infrastructure and Smart Production Division in UNIDO. Shahid Hassan has worked as a pharmaceutical sector project advisor with UNIDO over 12 years. During his uh, tenure, he formulated pharmaceutical sector development strategies for countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and also led the project to develop pharmaceutical market information system for member countries of the East African community. Prior to UNIDO, Hassan working in marketing and business development for each uh, for tech, technical startups and growth companies in the semiconductor and telecom industries. Dear participants, the four industrial revolution hold a process improvements in the pharmaceutical industry. Manufacturers need to comply with the strict requirements for documentation, data integrity, and process validation. Digital technologies are bringing the possibility to make compliance and automatic since part of the quality process. 
At the same time, for industrial revolutions such as artificial intelligence and big data are accelerating the development process of medicines and vaccines, which is are very important in these days. However, the digital transformation of the industry, further exacerbated by this ongoing pandemic that we are facing now, also presents significant challenges. This, this session will examine current trends and discusses how developing countries can harness emerging opportunities. Our external invited panelists will provide insights, the concepts of Pharma 4.0 and the ongoing technological and regulatory trends in the sector, while our colleague Shahid will give insights into the work that UNIDO is doing for supporting the development of pharmaceutical manufacturing in developing countries. We will have a round of initial presentations from the panelists, and later on, we will continue with a discussion panel. We will encourage you to raise your questions through the question and answer uh, box, as usual. For your information, we will record also the session and we'll make the panelist presentation available on our knowledge hub later on for your uh, discourse. So having said that, I will start sharing my screen now. And I will uh, start with our first skipper, a speaker. Mr. Uh, Christoph Herwig, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction into that. I will uh, directly jump in and show you a couple of challenges um, for the Pharma 4.0 uh, concept and let's say the technologies behind of that. Um, so what are we talking about? Uh, let's say what is the, the main framework? What uh, we, we see here is we have, uh, of course, the liver uh, let's say uh, drugs here everywhere to the world. We have to have affordable drugs for the world. I think that's a big driver. Yeah. On the other hand, we have also uh, drug shortages which we face uh, across um, the world here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have here, uh, of course, uh, technological uh, problems like fail batches, um, but we also have, let's say, new um, product routes which are coming up more and more, like biosimilars, of course, also for developing countries, etc., cetera, um, and personalized medicine, so new modality. And let's say when you link these two elements together, we need to optimize biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, however, this is really a problem because uh, we have a big knowledge gap on the cellular and product complexity. And on the other hand, we have also life cycle effects, which are actually uh, available uh, when you go from the development to manufacturing and even inside of routine manufacturing. So what we actually see here is, of course, there need to be an enabler. And this is, of course, Pharma 4.0 in terms of digitalization and also data science, which is one big part. So what needs to be done? It needs to be done that any process manufacturing chain, which you may see here, um, it needs to be uh, deliver, deliver final product here at the end at constant quality for all the runs which we are having. However, this also needs to be the case in case pros parameters of, uh, let's say, a certain step are actually changing. And uh, this one is, of course, not what we should see. We should know the control strategy we should know what actually gets out of that here despite certain variations which may propagate across this uh, chain so what is the pharma 4.0 here pharma 4.0 is actually combining um here the uh, uh, industry 4.0 framework which i will shortly touch also with the regulatory documents which you may be aware of mainly let's say propagated by the uh, ICH uh, here, um, International Conference of Harmonization, um, here with these kind of different uh, documents here, and especially uh, focusing here on ICH Q12 and Q10 when, uh, it, when it concerns uh, um, Pharma 4.0. So where do we get from here when we combine these two elements? We actually get to this picture, which is also part of probably Teresa's uh, presentation of the ISPE. Uh, with a colleague of mine and uh, fostered by the Pharma 4.0 special yeah. interest group of the ISPE. And you see that we actually have four quadrants of elements uh, which we need to push, resources, culture, information systems, 
And of course, also here, what I mentioned, the control strategy, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, we need to put forward. Okay. This is of course, in the framework of integrity by design of the data. So the data have to be okay. And the data need to develop and they have to get mature and we have to use them in the different levels. I will come to that. This is called digital maturity. So we need control strategies. I think that uh, is clear. So what kind of control strategies do we actually have? Normally in the traditional approach, uh, we uh, use end product testing and that is not what we need to do in order to be flexible, in order to respond and to have a predictive, a positive outcome of a product uh, with the right quality. We have to go to that level of real-time automated control with flexible post parameters to respond to the variability in the input material attributes. And at least we should have that level, which is more the data-driven level, reduced end product testing and more data-driven approaches to actually understand the quality outcome and its relationship to its post parameters. This is also what, uh, let's say, here is propagated by the SPA. So when we look at this one, how is this uh, done? How can we actually achieve that? Uh, this is related to the uh, uh, data maturity model, which you see here. And uh, of course, number one, we should see the data. Um, that's a level two, probably having some visualization of the data, difficult enough. Then we should go to the transparency of the data to understand. So that's a process understanding between uh, parameters and variables. Then we should go even further into the predictive, let's say, uh, capacity. So uh, understanding what will happen, that is important. And last but not least, having algorithms, probably driven by machine learning and AI, um, by uh, adaptability uh, solutions uh, here to actually have a self-optimizing system. This is the digital transformation, which we have to do and this data maturity we have to run. So this one actually leads uh, to uh, this kind of approach that the digital twin here is for the full, um, let's say life cycle of the product uh, here, the enabler for that. Uh, this is um, here shown in these two dimensions. Number one, we have the life cycle of the product, which starts of course with the product development, process development, finally going to production and of course discontinuation. And this one is of course very much interweaved um, here um, with the supply chain, uh, which we have on this axis and the digital twin shall help everyone. What kind of tools we think we should have here in the um, Pharma 4.0 um, area. So of course we have the tools, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, helping here in product discovery, for example, here, prediction of process events, which may happen here, but also here allowing adaptability to new conditions in the production. And of course, being there for flexible production in order to respond, let's say, to the market needs, which may come, of course, from marketing and, um, let's say, uh, different uh, business needs. On the other hand, for example, we have here a tool called blockchain, for example, which may allow us probably to streamline the supply chain and to be, of course, very much quicker. And what we have also published here is actually to ensure data integrity. That's a very high level and where actually we shall get with Pharma 4.0 um, here along these two uh, dimensions. However, we are not there. We start normally here, not only in developing countries, also uh, in, uh, in um, uh, everywhere in the world globally, we have the problems that the data are not there. Lots of data sources, heterogeneous formats, manual process, silos, uh, storage is transfer is difficult. I think this is the real world where we actually start. And before we do anything on AI, we probably need to solve data management. And the data come not only, let's say, from dispersed uh, data sources, they also come from different unit operations here. They will come along the life cycle, so from the process development until manufacturing. And we have, of course, to have a tool which links all these elements together and not only inside of, a, of, a organ, of an organization, but also with all the parts. So what we need is actually a tool uh, linking all the data together, getting not only a data lake, but contextualize the data, having, let's say, a domain-specific data model, and finally 
of mm -hmm. course, uh, the tools to actually apply AI, et cetera. So AI and ML may come later when we have solved these kind of issues. And I think this one we have to follow. Okay, I think that's all what I have. And um, yeah, I'm happy to see um, the uh, questions later on in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cristo, for uh, showing us some more on the concepts around uh, Pharma 4.0, the, uh, the, the relevance of data yeah, as, as a key factor for, for uh, the process uh, control strategy, and also for showing us on, on several applications of, of these technologies uh, along the value chain. Thank you very much. We will continue now with uh, Tony. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I would like to explain you the artificial intelligence role in biopharmaceuticals by introducing some challenges that I'm sure that they will sound familiar for all of you. I say challenges, but maybe I would say opportunities. In December 2020, the WHO announced the commitment of delivering 2 billion of doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, and we are in a good shape, but that produced a storm of multiple initiatives. Nowadays, more than 150 programs to produce different types of machine of medicines to treat the virus are in process. And the regulatory bodies must work in a total different situation. The full society is under a permanent state of pharmacovigilance because the urgency and emergency of the situation forced to us to move fast. And this month, we received a very good news that would be a new challenge and maybe a new opportunity as well. The US government is considering the possibility of releasing some COVID-19 vaccines patents. The question is, are all countries ready to participate in the democratization of the vaccine? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not just talking about getting vaccinated, but producing vaccines as well. Maybe the next slide can help us to answer this question. This information is related to this month. In the left hand, the lighter the color, the less immunized the population is. In the right, the lighter the color, the less industrial capabilities. And well, it's easy to identify the similarities. And for that, I would like to introduce AI, artificial intelligence, as the cornerstone to fix this inequality regarding drug manufacturing. When we talk about drug manufacturing, we have to talk about raw material, equipment, human beings, operators, recipes, procedures, good practices, knowledge, and control. That complexity can be managed by artificial intelligence because AI is able to simulate human cognition for complex problems in a systematic way. AI is open source, science-based, and easy to use. So anyone can create AI models, but only good AI can work in pharma, and the secret is to use quality and connected data. Well, before to go to some real use cases, let me emphasize which kind of benefits we can get in biopharmaceuticals from the AI implementation. First of all, complex scenarios can be understood by interpreting the multivariable dimensional of the reality that we are living. The reality is not managed by just one or two or three dimensions thousands of dimensions, thousands of variables they are putting together the reality in place. We can detect anomalies and issues before they happen, and we can get recommendations about the best configuration to obtain the better quality in batches. Actually, we are applying these AI capabilities in a project in collaboration with the PDA and the Imperial College of London. In this case, we are designing a robust process fully controlled by AI, to produce vaccines based on the mRNA principle by means patterns and cause effect interactions. That would allow to democratize this kind of vaccine productions. This graphic shows how the mRNA synthesis works. From a biochemistry perspective, the process is not too much complex, but from an industrial point of view, there are many, many stages and operations that generate difficulties. Acquiring all the data produced during the biochemical reactions, we guide the process to the right end, applying AI in real time. Let me bring now a couple of examples of AI applied in pharmaceutical companies where we got amazing results. This use case is based on a downstream process, more specifically in the ultrafiltration operation. 
this is a good example about how much important it is to have good data and data of quality. The problem is that this biotech drug process takes a long time to produce a batch, between 10 and 15 days. Any efficiency we can avoid or time reduction we can achieve would be really beneficial. We had just a few batches, two per month since two years ago, so that is more or less around 16 total to create value. We detected that five of them were not valid in terms of data consistency. What we did, we maximized the existing data. We identified the most relevant factors in this particular filtration process directly affecting the quality of the final product. The pump speed was the most relevant control influencing to the polarimetry at the end of the process. Polarimetry is the best attribute we found by AI to indicate the product quality. Well, considering all the raw material attributes and setup parameters, nowadays we are recommending the optimal and instantaneous pump speed to get the better quality in the less time. Nowadays, only one ultrafiltration run is performed. So we increase up to 50% the efficiency of the project the process. In this use case, uh, we're talking about a multinational biopharma company that produced drugs based on human plasma. This company is also developing a treatment for COVID-19 based on the plasma fractionation. Could you imagine how much difficult it is to keep a consistent yield on final product when the raw material is high human blood coming from many different countries and donors? The experts of this firm experimented a decreasing yield over years with no root cause detected. We're talking about hundreds of quality attributes and thousands of control parameters. This large number of, of, of values and variety of data was managed by means big data techniques connecting all the critical data sources. What we did, we reduced the dimensionality of the problem and we created AI models based on AI supervised and unsupervised algorithms for the critical phases. Each phase requires several AI models to predict the right control values to achieve the optimum results, operation by operation. That means that several AI models are defining the right path stage by stage, changing the output of a phase with the input of the next phase. And well, this is a short list about what AI is doing today in drug manufacturing, supporting humans to get safe, efficient, and quality medicines. Well, just summary, health is a human right and drug manufacturing would be democratized around the world. Only a person who has not been vaccinated can develop a new variant of the virus. The knowledge to manage successful drug production require control on complex processes to act based on the continuous variability around manufacturing. AI is the only mechanism to automate human cognition. AI works for biopharmaceuticals, generating predictions, recommendations, and identifying anomalies before they happen, supporting human beings in repetitive tasks. Well, AI and the needed technology is here to help us. Just use it. Thank you so much for this attending. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for this very uh, lifeful and, 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 and very nice views uh, that you shared to us, yeah? um, particularly on the challenges around the production of, of vaccines in the world and how AI can represent uh, the, more uh, an opportunity to overcome of these uh, challenges. Thank you very much. We will continue now with Teresa. Teresa, the floor is yours. I, I was in here. Thank you so much. So it is with a, a great pleasure and the honor that I have accepted this invitation to share the pharma regulatory trends to which digital transformation and 4.0 are the proactive responses. Today's agenda. We will start with global regulatory trends and how 4.0 is supporting responses, followed by the ISP approach and an extract from the last global survey related to pharma 
And as a conclusion, why? Why we should embrace 4.0 in pharma? Please note that the point of view I wish to transmit represents ISPE, the leading no-profit global association for pharma professionals. There are, of course, also my personal views, having spent my professional career in digital transformation and life sciences. Please note also that Pharma 4.0 is a European ISP trademark. I would like to highlight here some of the key pharma global regulatory requirements and how Pharma 4.0 can help our industry be compliant. Please note that there is a convergence on the regulatory requirement, despite the fact that each region or even country has its own rules. In the interest of time, I must be quick, and I will not mention all the countries and rules, but you can see them on this slide. Please note that in regard to, let's start with continuous process verification, 4.0 is supporting the automatic collection of data, keeping production processes under full control. And then data integrity, already mentioned, paper-based data integrity is extremely inefficient and critical. We need digital solutions to better comply. And then knowledge management, just one example, virtual reality can support training sessions, less effort, mistakes, and lower cost. Quality metrics, digital solution tracks, changes, deviation kappa for the benefit of authorities, but also industries. Real time and parametric release, interfacing equipment is a must here. And then distance assessment. Consider the pandemic and how remote assessment has been key in allowing the show to go on. As you saw in the two previous slides, it is a global trend. So, sorry, I made a mistake. <laughs> Authorities require pharma industry improvement globally. We need it. Think about the pandemic and the ability to deliver innovative medicine faster than used to be. On the other end, as you can see, 4.0 technologies are available globally in most cases now at sustainable cost to support this change. Please note that first and foremost, a Pharma 4.0 program is based primarily on people and culture and is only, let me stress, only built using enabling technologies. There are multiple regulations at global level, as seen before. Regulatory trends are moving in the same direction and apply to the entire pharma value chain. However, industry is struggling to comply with so many different regulations. That's why global harmonization is required. And this is where ICH is working, International Council for Harmonization. As you can see, many countries, also those emerging, are participating, even only as observers. And then the IFP approach moving from industry 4.0 to pharma 4.0. Everything begins with the awareness that at the end of our value chain, we have a patient, not a customer, not a consumer. We need to take care of patient safety first. And this is where regulation makes all the difference. Nevertheless, we know that regulation needs interpretation. That's why ISPE provides practical guidance like GAMP guidelines used worldwide to validate computerized systems, embedding regulatory best practice to interpret regulations for the use of digital solution and 4.0 in pharma. We, as ISPE, as already mentioned by the previous speaker, we have designed an operating model based on ICH to support the success of pharma project at global level. And as ISP, we have created a special uh, survey dedicated to Pharma 4.0. We are now at the fourth edition. We had 10 questions. And you see here the, the question of the last edition. That was the 2020 edition. We had 400 answers from ISP members globally. The 20 
uh, first edition, so this year edition, is undergoing preparation and will be presented in Vienna in December this year in our conference. So the, survey served, the, the coverage of the survey has been global, 52 territories. And then what is in very key here, what I want to share with you, is the maturity level that we uh, had, the responses. So in red, you can find about one fifth of the sample have not started yet any Pharma 4.0 project. In, in yellow, 37% just starting. We saw massive growth during the pandemic here. In light green, a third only having pilots. And then in green only, let's say, 17 experiencing systematic ongoing action, demonstrating that only, we are all only at the beginning of the Pharma 4.0 journey. The last uh, extract that I want to share with you is about the maturity of the technology adoption. Complex life, but just to say that we asked with the top 4.0 enabling technologies and respondents were asked to select among have they adopted in a large or small scale, pilot, planning, or are they evaluating implementation? We clustered the answer in three categories. As you can see on the bottom, the blue cluster are cloud mobile collaboration platform. They are, I would say, quite, quite widely adopted. And then the green cluster, IoT, advanced robotics, and, and uh, advanced analytics, less adopted, uh, potentially less mature for pharma. We asked ourselves within the special interest group, is validation complexity a barrier? And then the red cluster. As you can see, the artificial intelligence, very well described by Tony, uh, advanced analytics, robotics, for sure, less adopted. Uh, we asked the, again ourselves uh, uh, the reason why, for sure, as Tony said, there are a lot of opportunities here uh, to, for projects to, to be developed. And then my last. Uh, personal views. So please note that two reasoning points. Fourth revolution, unlike the others, does not involve a specific new invention, but information anytime, anywhere is key. Think also to this. In this revolution, it is uh, valid through the equation product equal product multiplied by information. And you know why? Because if you have no information, you have no product. Only one example. In serialization, so after the serialization adoption, where applicable, of course, if you have a drug package without the right unique matrix code in a pharmacy, that package will not be dispensed to the patient. So no information, no product. And then the why. Why we need to embrace 4.0 projects? For sure to gain the right information at the right time, at the right place, to support decision, uh, Tony said, in a predictive way, of course, that, that's the big news, but not only for managers and CEOs, also to operator, operator on production line, to regulatory agencies, and up to patients. Imagine the power of digital therapeutics, the huge help that they can uh, give to patients. Of course, always in full regulatory compliance, we are in pharma, but again, never forgetting the why. We need to timely deliver quality, effective and safe drugs at sustainable cost. I will add in whichever country that you may reside, whether emerging or not. Finally, thank you. Thank you for having invited me. Thank you for your time. Follow ISP. You can find some detail about SPE in the letter. Visit our website for more info and contact me. Feel free to contact me for any doubts or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, for showing us on the relevance of regulatory requirements and the linkages to Industry 4.0 and particularly to Pharma 4.0. Uh, also for sharing us with uh, the vision of ISPE yeah, and the uh, approach that you are following on this. Thank you very much. I will continue with our last uh, presenter. Shahid, the floor is yours. 
my colleagues have been talking about uh, systemic use of data transformations across processes. I'm only going to talk about a specific solution or a particular application. The, the title of this talk is Market Data-Centered Approach to Development of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing in Developing Countries. Uh, I only have eight minutes, so I'll just briefly introduce the topic. Talk about the concept of a pharmaceutical market information system at national or country level that was actually designed and deployed by UNIDO in the 2017-18 timeframe in a couple of East African countries. If there's time at the end, I'll talk about extension of this uh, to a, a regional or perhaps a, a, a global level. Uh, the pandemic in the last year and a half has really focused our minds on uh, disruptions in the global supply chain for medical products. And this doesn't just apply to for vaccines and PPE and uh, you know medical devices like ventilators, but also to essential medicine. So supply security has become an increasing concern and there's a greater focus more than ever before on local production. Now, if you, have, if you want to make policy initiatives to enhance local production of medical products, specifically in, in my case, the focus is on essential medicines, this cannot proceed without an overall understanding of the patterns of supply and consumption in a country or in a region. And unfortunately, there is usually very limited information available in most developing countries with regard to their pharmaceutical markets. So we're gonna talk about this, as I said, a concept of a pharmaceutical market information system at national or country level. Uh, let's skip a couple of slides in the interest of time. Uh, what is the information that we need to collect in a, a, in a, for, for about the pharmaceutical market? Well, about all these various categories of medicines, commercially imported medicines, uh, which is typically in a developing country could be 70 to up to 90% of the market. Donated medicines, which are also coming in from outside the country, uh, but it's a special type of import because it's financed differently. It's paid for by entities like the Global Fund and UNICEF and the US government's PEPFAR program, but it's also a, a type of import. Then there are, of course, the medicines manufactured and supplied by local industry, which is what we want to encourage, perhaps, and re-exported medicines, medicines that are coming into a country but are not actually consumed within the country are re-exported to a the third country. What are the market data sources? Well, let's take an example. You know, you, you for the case of commercially imported medicines, you can get information on what has been authorized for import from import permits that are issued by the regulator to commercial importers. They have to specify what quantities of medicines, which medicine they and the values of the medicines that they want to import. That's what's authorized. But by the time the, the actual import happens, uh, sometimes the price has fluctuated or the importer has changed his mind about the quantity of uh, medicines that they are going to bring into the country. So the actual uh, medicines that are coming into the country, that information is captured in customs clearance documentation in the customs department of the National Revenue Authority. So there's the authorized import and then the actual import. And that applies uh, also for donated and exported medicines. Now, re-exported medicines. For locally produced medicines, unfortunately, there is very little, usually, systematic data collection on uh, medicines that are produced by uh, local industry. Those are the data sources. But if, if all of this data already exists, then wh why is there a problem with uh, pharmaceutical market uh, information in a market? Because the data that exists has not been accessible. We've already said that there's typically so, uh, very little systematic data collection from domestic industry. Data is not shared between databases. The regulator has a database, the customs people have a database and they don't share the data. Even if they wanted to share the data, the databases are often incompatible because the medicines are classified in one way in the regulator and classified in a different way by customs. So they cannot translate the data. And ultimately, the databases are not open. If there are users who need the data, cannot access the databases at customs, cannot access the database at the regulator. So what use is it then? You know, if it's not usable by the, uh, by the people who really need it. But there are solutions that exist. The, the regulator can be charged to collect production and export data from domestic manufacturers. They're the closest to local industry. 
There are now in developing countries increasingly implementation of electronic single windows, which link the information systems of the regulator and customs. There are international classification systems that are available that, that, are, uh, that, can, that can be used broadly across databases to classify medicines in the same way. And a national level, the registration number issued by the regulator can be used as a unique product identifier through the systems and databases. And these are the solutions that are the, the ideas that were combined in the pharmaceutical market information system that you need to deploy. The, uh, the um, uh, regulator was made custodian of the, of the market information system. All medicines circulating in the domestic market were classified using an international system. The registration number from the NMRA was used as a unique product uh, uh, identifier. And finally, the database was made searchable at different levels of access by different levels of users. So, and that was what was uh, implemented at the national level. Just a couple of uh, comments about how this can be compiled in a, in a, in, in, into regional data. Uh, this is possible, but you'd have to uh, build in the integration capability into the architecture of the national level pharmaceutical market information systems. You'd also have to, have to use naturally a common classification system and there, be other, there are other prerequisites uh, that are mentioned uh, in the slide. And finally, one comment about how this could be actually extended to the global level. Ultimately, all medicines produced anywhere in the world and registered with any regulator should be capturable in a global database with a unique international pharmaceutical product number, or IPPN. Now, this is already done, in fact, in the publishing industry, for instance. If you go to any major library in the world, you'll see textbooks with uh, ISBNs, international standard book numbers that are issued by uh, the ISBN agency has been around for 50 years. And, and, and there is, it's surprising that this is not there in the case of medicines, which are so much more uh, critical, one could argue. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the direction that we can aspire to in the era of big data. It could be the IPPN or the International Pharmaceutical Product Number could be linked to a international classification system. Access to such data would facilitate acquisition of new products by uh, manufacturers in developing countries, cross-registration by regulators in different countries, and procurement in, terms, in times of emergency. And finally, such a global database could be initiated by a UN agency like UNIDO or WHO working with suitable partners. This is a, pro a project that could be worthy of, a, of an organization uh, such as ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shahid, for sharing us on, on, on the concept of pharma market information system and, and uh, what is the approach that you have been uh, conducting, but also uh, for this uh, potential, um, uh, let's say, uh, action that we can take in the future from UNIDO side on that. Thank you very much. Let's start with the first uh, round of questions. The first question will be with Christoph. Christoph, as it stands, there is a considerable uh, pharmaceutical divide between high income and developing countries. One increasing digitalization lead to poor countries falling behind. How can we bridge the gap in producing local generic medicines? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think, yeah, there is a danger. There is no doubt. Let's say that the speed can be there, um, absolutely. But uh, I think what we have seen from the different contributions also is that we have, um, let's say, first to tackle data. And uh, probably the advanced algorithms, they probably are probably difficult to understand, et cetera, whatever. But the data are available everywhere. And I believe we have, should have enablers here uh, to actually first grab the data. I think, Shahid, um, you mentioned that also, uh, which can be spread also to, development, to, to developing countries, actually to be, uh, let's say, uh, quicker, let's say also in the, in the terms of process understanding. That would be one issue. And the other issue is that actually all the training and, document and, and education due to digitalization should be much, much, much more facilitated now. I think the access to education, to courses, 
um, to e-learning platforms, etc., should really help a lot actually to bring development countries on speed here in terms of education. And I think this is a big contribution uh, which we can provide here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. I will continue now with Tony. Tony, the pandemic has underscored the critical gap in vaccine manufacturing in Africa, which uh, represents 26% of the world population, but less than 0.1% of the world vaccines production. African leaders pledged recently to increase the share of vaccines manufacturing in Africa to 60% by 2040. How can foreign industrial revolution technologies like AI or others support faster market authorization and reduce its registration times for local products? Thank you for the question. And I think that cloud technologies can represent very well the answer. With cloud technology, we can put all the data that we are nowadays distributed in silos all together, accessible for the regulatory bodies. Cloud technology, for example, do you know the cost of one gigabyte of information on the cloud already encrypted uh, with continuous backup in a securitized way only cost one cent of dollar per month. So that can be save a lot of money if you have not to invest this amount of, of, of money in your data centers. If you have not to buy servers, if you have not to maintain IT, you can dedicate all your budget to produce tracks. So this is one way to do that. Another way is AI can packetize all the knowledge that we need in order to produce very good drugs from one side to other side. And in this package that we have AI, we have the recipe to deliver the right, the right drug. So we can deliver this AI package to the regulatory bodies in order to understand, in order to be audited and uh, well, well conducted. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Tony. I will continue now with Teresa. Teresa, you presented the regulatory challenges and how stringent requirements for documentation or data integrity in the area has a slow with adoption of advanced technologies relative to other industries. But what best practices can developing countries replicate to strengthen their policies and environment conducive to adoption of these technologies? And what role can standards play to this end? You are mute, Teresa. Someone muted me. Yes, on one end, you're right. Stringent requirements on validation, for example, have led to a slower uh, new technologies adoption. But I have to say that today, more and more, things on the regulatory side are changing. And as also laid down in my presentation, regulation are in fact uh, promoting digital transformation. So we have all to transform a problem into an opportunity. And yes, we require standard, we require guidance to interpret the rule, all the rules that we have, but ISP and all the working group inside ISP are there to, to support our industry and the whole ecosystem on this. So join a professional association like ISP and network, share the knowledge. This will be key. Okay, thank you for the invitation also to join. Uh, Chahid, we have learned from you that policymakers need reliable pharmaceutical market information to be able to design policies to promote local production of medicines. But it may be difficult to justify the implementation of a pharmaceutical market information system for the needs of policymakers alone. Are there others who are possible beneficiaries of good information on pharmaceutical markets in developing countries? Yeah, uh, th thanks for bringing that up, Alejandro. Yes, uh, you know, I, I spoke about uh, the need for market pharmaceutical market data from the policymakers' perspective, you know, how they need that information to be able to design proper incentives and, uh, uh, you know, other uh, ways to encourage local production. And, uh, but there are other constituencies that need this uh, information as well. It's, there's actually a slide in the presentation which I skipped in 
in the interest of time. But there are at least three other constituencies that are important. The first and the major one are the pharmaceutical manufacturers themselves in developing countries, because at the moment, they are making their strategic business decisions in the dark. They don't have enough information even about their own markets. They sample get little bits of data, but nobody really has a comprehensive idea of their own markets in many developing countries. And they are a key user, a potential constituency for uh, this uh, kind of pharmaceutical market data. In addition to the pharmaceutical policymakers and the pharmaceutical manufacturers themselves, there are also investors and the financial community. We would like to funnel more investment into the pharmaceutical sector in developing countries, but investors don't like to go where they don't have information. Where, th where things are murky, they shy away from, from sectors like that. So we would like to provide them with pharmaceutical sector market data, so they are encouraged. And finally, as you say, last but not least, uh, there is the, the public health community and they would like to see how drugs are used in, in, in these developing countries. That's very important for matters of irrational use of drugs for pharmacovigilance, et cetera. So there are, there are other very key constituencies that require this pharmaceutical market uh, information. And, and in combination, they can be easily justified. The, uh, such a system can easily be justified in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Shahid. I will continue now with Christoph. Christo, for small and medium-sized enterprises in the pharma sector, high investments and operating costs are among the main barriers to 4IR implementation. How can we facilitate the technology transfer, particularly those in developing countries? Yeah, I believe um, we... Uh, have to set up these kind of uh, pharma 4.0 tools like digital uh, cloud solutions i think these are very easy we are having uh, lots of solutions in using SaaS solutions software as a service solutions here to actually facilitate uh, proper tech transfer uh, that is very, let's say, easy to access. It doesn't need infrastructure really uh, on developing countries. It's actually just a web URL, if you like. Um, and uh, then uh, you can uh, actually uh, really transfer knowledge selectively, uh, share data, but also process understanding or even AI models uh, across the world. I think this is really there. It really can, uh, uh, can uh, help and can be really beneficial without really... Um, building up huge amount of costs here. You're mute. Thank you very much. I will continue now with Tony. Tony, despite the large percentage of women in healthcare, in 2018, one third of the top 50 pharma companies had no women on their boards. The digital transformation of pharmaceutical manufacturing has the potential to keep start better gender quality. How can the ongoing digital transformation empower women to succeed in the industry? Well, technology and AI is within everyone's reach. And the use of such as a science based on knowledge and technology at the same time has the ability to empower everyone with the same opportunities without to make difference in terms of gender or race or age. If we bring this opportunity, extending the infinite capabilities of AI to the entire world, equality will be part of our culture and DNA. So it's just a matter of time that we use AI in our daily life. Okay, thank you. Teresa, concerning the uptake of four industrial revolution technologies with the pharmaceutical sector, it is likely that we will see job displacement or rather greater specialization of the existing workforce. Thank you. Thank you for this question. We would need probably one hour to debate on this, but uh, to be quick, uh, uh, for sure, there would be a huge change 
and is as in any revolution, there will be some turbulence. So for sure, skill, skills required by the worker will change, and we will have more and more specialized workers. So encompassing a more holistic competence, mechanic, computer science, biologics, all together, this for sure will happen. OK, thank you very much. My next question is with uh, Shahid. Shahid, can business uh, organizations relate, uh, contribute to the digital transformation of the sector? What is the role that regional and continental pharmaceutical manufacturers associations can play to facilitate this transformation? Uh, they can not only contribute, it is vital that they contribute. And uh, as I said in, my, in the response to the earlier question, they are a key user of this data. They need this data probably more than any of the other constituencies, policymakers, the health community, and financial community. They, they are frontline users uh, of this data. Um, the first step they can, they can take is actually collect the information about their own local production. In a lot of developing countries, they, they, you know, the, the companies don't share information with each other because they're competitors and they don't want this private information to go to their competitors. But there is a way to manage that. You know, the, the regulator has all kinds of private data uh, for all these manufacturers. And if they could prevail on the regulator to collect this information individually from each manufacturer, but only uh, report those results in aggregate, so that you're talking about the, the overall market picture without identifying confidential information from any particular company, that's the solution. And that's something that, that the pharmaceutical manufacturers or their business organizations can uh, push for. They can also push for this whole, the lobby for this, uh, the formulation or the institution of these pharmaceutical market information systems in general and push for all those elements that I talked about you know, uh, uh, product classification, linking of databases, uh, uh, managing the incompatibility of databases. They can be a powerful lobbying force for this. And that is their role. OK, thank you very much. I, I thank all of you for, for all these um, uh, presentations, nice presentations, and also for sharing with us all this knowledge. Uh, I would like to close uh, the session with, with the final words from you as a final key message that you would like to provide each of you uh, on considering uh, the potential of pharma industry in the current times and also how for industrial revolution can, can uh, accelerate the adoption of all this, all, all, all this uh, I mean, can't, can't have an impact on, on, on the situation we are having now. I will start with Christoph. Um, it's sure. a revolution. It's a revolution. So in this way, there will be changes. I think uh, humanity can only develop if we are ready for changes. Um, and we should see that really as an opportunity and not as a threat. I think that's really clear. Good. Tony, from your side. People who work for pharma, we have a responsibility. So we have to evolve with the full society in order to serve to patients. At the end, we have to have our focus in the patient. Great. Thank you. Teresa? Yes, thank you. But for me, what I would like to underline is that this fourth revolution is really as a key point information, as I was saying information uh, at the right time, in the right place uh, to support decision. And that, that's the point. And uh, the why that I have already mentioned. So we have to remember that at the end of our value chain, we have a patient. And so that's why everything need to, let's say, push us to embrace 4.0, because there will be a huge value for patients while we will have all uh, embraced 4.0 projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shahi? Again, a narrower answer. Uh, what in the, 10 years ago, a decade ago, when we were not in the era of big data, we couldn't dream of collecting all this information and utilizing it. 
but we are there now and therefore we should uh, utilize the tools that are coming on for us to get better idea of markets and thereby help the, the pharmaceutical sectors in developing countries to get further and further. Local production is getting more and more important and we should encourage that with the use of data. Great, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, again uh, the panelists for sharing all this uh, knowledge with us and, and also to all those that attend this session. I would like to remind you that we have recorded this session and we will make it available on the DTA Knowledge Hub. All the questions that we have received or if you still want to send something, uh, we will answer uh, later on by the panelists or by us. And uh, please do not hesitate to contact me or any other colleague at the Office of the Managing Director in case you have any inquiries or for their uh, needs for cooperation on, with these experts that uh, accompanied us today. I will also like uh, to take the opportunity to invite all of you to attend the last webinar of this series, which will be focused on four industrial revolution technologies transforming the leader industry towards a circular economy. The invitation will be sent shortly. With that, uh, we are ready to close the session. Thank you again for having been here with us today, and we will look forward to working with all of you to implement our digital transformation st strategy and also journey. Have a love, lovely afternoon. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, everybody. Good. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank Ciao you. from Italy. Bye.